Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. As an engineer by trade, it's a genuine pleasure to speak to uh, an audience like this, uh, an audience that's enthusiastic about science and technology. Uh, as uh, your president said, I've spent my entire career in the energy sector, an industry which relies very heavily on the latest scientific breakthroughs and cutting edge uh, engineering applications. <clears throat> I joined BP as a young engineering apprentice after studying physics at university. So there's some use to physics. Uh, I thought it would just be for a year, but I ended up staying for 40. Uh, the practical challenges of working in harsh climates and in difficult geologies caught my imagination. And although I often thought about returning to academic life, in the end, I was enjoying my job simply too much. In my current role as president of the UK's uh, Royal Academy of Engineering, I now take a keen interest in how to encourage more people, in particular more young people, to take up careers in science and technology. And that's one of the reasons I was so keen to be here today. Opportunities like this, where hundreds of people representing dozens of countries can come together to learn and discuss, are very rare events. With this in mind, I want to use my remarks this morning to talk about energy, <coughs> in particular, <coughs> how science and technology can help solve the great challenges we face. As keen scientists, many of you will know that gaseous emissions associated with burning carbon-based fuels have been linked to global warming. A large number of scientific studies suggest that if our behavior continues along present lines, the world, in particular the population of the world, faces a potentially dangerous climate shift within the next century. But energy challenges don't stop at the environment. We must think about energy security, ensuring that our access to energy remains secure over the long term and uninterrupted by political or economic forces. And energy must be affordable for the citizens of the world. That's because access to energy underpins the spread of social justice and reduces some of the worst effects of poverty. It reinforces a virtuous circle, a virtuous cycle of individual prosperity and economic growth. Quite simply, without energy, and more importantly, without affordable energy, society can't continue to develop in the way that it has. Casting an eye back over our recent past, it's clear that energy has helped shape and define certain periods of history, what I call the four ages of energy. And the first was the age of biomass. Early civilizations, unlike their modern counterparts, were built on simple sources of energy, the burning of biomass alongside some basic hydropower was for a long time the dominant source of energy. Timber became a vital energy commodity, traded between nations, it was a source of power for those who already had access to it. And Roman and Greek dominance during the classical period was built on their access to large forests in southern Europe and the Middle East. In many ways, wood played a similar role to that of oil today. Not only was it the dominant energy resource, it had other socially important uses, such as providing building materials. The Phoenicians became the great seafaring nation using wood from ancient cedar forests to build their triremes. And to this day, the flag of Lebanon depicts the great cedar tree, which used to grow in abundance across that land. But the overwhelming reliance of these societies on a single source of fuel contained within it the seeds of their eventual downfall. Widespread deforestation in the Roman world hastened the decline of that once mighty empire. After the downfall of Rome, obviously came the Dark Ages, a period when civilization retreated and the frontiers of knowledge contracted. Progress, as we might understand it, was impeded by the lack of energy. Biomass continued to be the fuel uh, until society entered its second energy age, the age of coal. And humans have used coal for many centuries. Indians in North America 
were mining exposed coal seams for energy as early as the 14th century. But it was in the 18th century, <clears throat> right here in the UK, that coal established itself as the energy source behind the Industrial Revolution, probably the most transformative period in history. New coal-fired furnaces allowed large quantities of iron to be mass-produced at lower costs, and coal revolutionized transport, powering a new generation of steam trains across Britain. Thanks to these technological innovations and a ready supply of coal, Britain grew to become the foremost manufacturing nation in the world. The growing economy brought with it a remarkable period of political reform, intellectual debate, and social change. But it also sparked a demographic boom of historic proportions. Britain's population more than trebled during the 19th century, with a growing proportion living in cities, sometimes in squalid conditions. Overcrowding was common, disease was rife, and pollution was a major problem. Once again, we can observe the Janus face of energy, the power behind social progress, yet the cause of significant social problems. And that's the pattern we see repeated today in the third age, the age of hydrocarbons. Crude oil, in particular, has had a profound effect on society. Transport fuels made from oil, whether for boats, cars, or planes, allow human beings to traverse the globe in a manner unthinkable 50 years ago. Not only is it the single largest fuel source in our energy mix, oil is a key ingredient in the production of important products, such as lubricants and plastics. Natural gas, too, is an extremely versatile substance used to produce fertilizers and to heat people's homes, as well as to generate electricity. These two fuels are often found together. They're extracted together and even lend their names to a distinctly modern type of business, the oil and gas company. They've shaped the world we live in, but our dependence on them poses a number of problems. Ensuring a sustainable supply of hydrocarbons for the future is primary amongst them. Arguments about an imminent peak in oil and gas production are grossly overstated. In the past decade, proven reserves of both fuels have either grown in line or outpaced the rise in demand. The concerns about the concentration of energy reserves in the hands of very few nations often located in politically insecure regions of the world, are important. The OPEC cartel controls more than three quarters of global oil reserves, accounting for nearly half of total production. And more than half of the world's remaining proven gas reserves exist in just three countries, Russia, Iraq, Iran, and Qatar. Another potentially more critical issue is the environmental damage caused by our continued use of carbon-rich fuels. Despite some recent re-evaluation of scientific evidence, climate change remains a present danger, and the devastating Gulf of Mexico spill is a reminder of the significant local environmental risks of extracting hydrocarbons. Fortunately, this combination of energy challenges points to a single solution, the transition to the fourth and hopefully final energy period, the age of sustainable energy. Because only when the world's energy is truly sustainable, secure and affordable, as well as environmentally friendly, can we say that social progress too is on a sustainable path. Responding to the great need for change, policymakers across the world have introduced a raft of measures to accelerate transition to a new energy age. In China, government leaders have announced stretching targets to improve energy efficiency, while in the US, President Obama's administration is pressing once again to pass a new energy bill through Congress. Here in Europe, the EU countries have agreed to a joint emissions target for 2020 and introduced a mandatory cross-border